Hello and a very warm welcome to all of you listening. I hope that you are all fit and well. You join me today as we continue on with our study of Mark's Gospel. In today's sermon we will look at the death of the Lord Jesus. Our reading is verses 33 to 41 of chapter 15. So this is Mark chapter 15 verses 33 to 41. At noon darkness came over the whole land until three in the afternoon. And at three in the afternoon Jesus cried out in a loud voice, Eloi, Eloi, lemma sabachthani, which means, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? When some of those standing near heard this, they said, Listen, he's calling Elijah. So one ran, filled a sponge with wine vinegar, put it on a staff and offered it to Jesus to drink. Now leave him alone. Let's see if Elijah comes to take him down, he said. With a loud cry, Jesus breathed his last. The curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. And when the centurion who stood there in front of Jesus saw how he died, he said, Surely this man was the Son of God. Some women were watching from a distance. Among them were Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James the younger, and of Joseph and Salome. In Galilee these women had followed him and cared for his needs. Many other women who had come up with him too, Jerusalem, were also there. This is the word of the Lord. Before we have a look at today's passage of scripture, let's take a few moments to review what we looked at last time. It's the Friday of Passion Week, the day we know today as Good Friday. Jesus had appeared in six trials. He had been mocked, abused and brutally scourged. Now he must face the ultimate horror, his crucifixion. As I mentioned last time, it was usual for the condemned prisoner to carry the horizontal portion of the cross, known as the patibulum, to the execution site. Due to the brutal flogging Jesus had received, he was unable to do this. Therefore, a passerby was compelled forced by the Roman execution squad to carry the crossbeam for him. This unfortunate man was called Simon, and Mark tells us that he was from Cyrene in northern Africa. He also interestingly adds that he was the father of Alexander and Rufus. The unusual inclusion of this detail strongly suggests that these men were known to at least some of Mark's original audience. We are speculating, of course, but perhaps their father's experiences led him to in turn follow Christ, and he too shared his faith with his sons. The site for the execution was known as Golgotha, meaning the place of the skull. It was most probably located just outside one of the city gates, and alongside a major road leading into the city of Jerusalem. There was no accident in this choice of location. The Romans picked prominent spots, so that the true impact of their punishment system would be observed by the greatest number of people. They wanted people to be shocked and awed by their brutality. Once Jesus, Simon and the execution squad arrive at Golgotha, it was time to crucify Jesus. Mark tells us that Jesus was offered some wine laced or mixed with myrrh to drink. This was intended to help dull the pain a little. It acted like a mild anaesthetic. The Lord Jesus refused to drink it. He did not want any medication or wine to cloud his senses or numb his pain. He would boldly face the agonising pain unaided. It's a good reminder to us today that when we face pain, either physical or emotional, we have a saviour who knows exactly what we are going through. Following this incident, it was time for the crucifixion to begin. The hour, Mark tells us, was the third hour, or 9am. Last time I'd laid out in some detail how the process took place. Jesus was stretched out and nails were driven through his wrists into the wood of the crossbeam. Then using forked sticks, he would have been lifted up and the crossbeam attached to the vertical stake. At this point, bending his knees slightly, his feet would have also been nailed to the cross. The Lord Jesus was now being crucified. The victim of crucifixion would remain in this position until they died. It was often a long, drawn-out process. The victim must endure the horrendous pain of the nail wounds, all the while trying to draw in breath. 
this, you see, was the wicked genius of the cross. You could not simply hang there in agony. In order to breathe, you had to lift yourself up and down. Every time you did so, you put pressure upon the nails driven through your skin. Every time you moved up and down, the ragged flesh on your back scraped against the rough wood of the cross. Mark also includes some other important details that we should not overlook. He tells us that whilst Jesus was being crucified, the soldiers gambled for his clothes. This was the fulfilment of Old Testament prophecy, Psalm 22 verse 18. We also learn that a wooden plaque or sign known as the titulus was prepared for Jesus. There was nothing special in this. It was common for a condemned prisoner to be accompanied to the execution site with a notice or sign telling people what they had done. This would then be attached to the cross. Jesus' sign, written in three languages, Aramaic, Latin and Greek, declared that this was the King of the Jews. It was intended, of course, as mockery. This was no king. This was just a dirty, common criminal. It was also a subtle reminder to the Jews that this is what would become of anyone they tried to raise up and use to oppose Rome. But what was intended as a joke, we know to be the truth. The Lord Jesus Christ is the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. We also learned that Jesus was crucified between two convicted robbers. Most likely they had been co-insurrectionists with the pardoned Barabbas. That he was killed alongside transgressors again fulfilled Old Testament prophecy, Isaiah 53 verse 12. We concluded last time by looking at the responses of three sets of people who were all observing Christ's death. First, we had the common people. They wagged their heads and blasphemed Jesus. They questioned why he who had claimed to have great power and authority could not use that power to come down from the cross. Secondly, we saw the reaction of the Jewish religious leaders. They mocked him like silly little children. Why, they asked, could this person who had saved so many others not save himself? Finally, we saw the reaction of the two robbers who were crucified alongside Jesus. They too began by mocking Jesus. But Luke, in his account, tells us that one of the robbers felt convicted. He recognised that they were guilty men, that they deserved the punishment they were receiving. But the Lord Jesus was different. He had done nothing wrong. So turning to Jesus, he said, Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. We are all familiar with Jesus' answer. Our Lord told him, Assuredly, I say to you, today you will be with me in paradise. It was true for that guilty robber back then, and it remains true today. If we acknowledge our sin and turn to Christ, then we too are invited into his kingdom. Today we will turn and consider Jesus' death. Verse 33. At noon, darkness came over the whole land until three in the afternoon. Mark, in his account of Jesus' death, includes five dramatic events. The darkness, two of Jesus' cries from the cross, the tearing of the temple veil or curtain, and the Roman centurion's confession. All of these events took place during the final three hours that Jesus spent on the cross, so from 12 noon to 3 p.m., we will look at all five of these today. The first notable event is the darkness that descends over the whole land. Have you ever witnessed a solar eclipse? It creates a very eerie sensation in the viewer as the moon comes between us here on earth and the sun's rays. What a moment ago was a sunny day slowly fades into darkness. I'm sure you are aware that solar eclipses are not very regular occurrences. In most calendar years, there are only usually two, although on very rare occasions, there can be up to five. When do solar eclipses occur? Now, this is very important, so please take note. They can only occur at the time of a new moon. At the first phase of the lunar cycle, the moon is located between the Earth and the Sun. Or, to put it more simply, the moon is in line with the Sun, and the Earth and Sun and Earth are on opposite sides of the Moon. So it's only at this time, when the Moon is perfectly aligned in front of the Sun, that it blocks out the Sun, giving us a solar eclipse. 
Why, you might ask, is all this important? Well, the Jewish Passover took place when the moon was full, a time in the lunar cycle when it's impossible for there to be a solar eclipse. So this was not a regular or normal solar eclipse. Neither was it a dust storm, a heavy fog, ash from a volcano or thick clouds. This was a miracle. It was God intervening in the natural order or running of the universe. So what's going on here? Why did God cause a darkness to fall across the land from 12 noon until 3 p.m. when the Lord Jesus died? There's a great deal of important symbolism lying behind this event, so let's unpack it now. What message was God sending to the people through this strange occurrence? Let's go back to the time just prior to the Israelites' exodus from Egypt. God, as we know, inflicted the Egyptians with ten plagues. He did this to convince the Pharaoh to let his people go. What was the ninth plague? It was darkness, and you can read all about it in Exodus chapter 10, verses 21 to 29. The Bible tells us that a thick and terrible darkness fell across the land for three days. Note that this fell only upon the Egyptians. The Israelites had light in their dwellings. Following the plague of darkness came the final and most horrific of the plagues. The tenth plague was the death of the firstborn. This was, of course, when the very first Passover occurred. And this was the feast that the Jews were gathered in Jerusalem to celebrate when Christ was crucified. So I hope that you can see the connection. In Egypt, three days of darkness occurred before the death of the firstborn. Now here, three hours of darkness occurred before the firstborn son will also die. In Egypt, it was the blood of the Passover lamb that served as covering protection God's people from death. Here it is the shed blood of the lamb, the Lord Jesus Christ, which allows God to pass over those who in rebellion deserve death. We should also not overlook the symbolism of darkness as a judgment motif. Throughout scripture, the darkening of the sun was often a sign of judgment. It was frequently used to show God's displeasure toward particular people. Let me read to you from the prophet Amos. And it shall come to pass in that day, says the Lord God, that I will make the sun go down at noon, and I will darken the earth in broad daylight. Amos chapter 8 verse 9. Here God speaks through his prophet of a day of judgment, when the songs of the temple shall become wailings. So God in this sign demonstrated two things. Firstly, he announced that his firstborn and beloved son, the Lamb of God, was giving his life for the sins of the world. Secondly, he showed that judgment was coming and that men better be prepared. A final word on the extent of the darkness. Was this darkness restricted to Jerusalem or just to Israel? Or was it global darkness? Solar eclipses, as we know, are regional in nature. The whole earth does not become dark during an eclipse. However, as I hope we've established, this was not a natural phenomenon. This was not a normal solar eclipse. So how widespread was this darkness? We don't, of course, have documents or, or reports from around the world. We do, however, have one secular source in the Roman historian Phlegon. He was born around 80 AD. He records that there was a full eclipse of the sun from the 6th to the 9th hour in 33 AD during the reign of Tiberius. He records that this was a worldwide, from his perspective, event. Well, let's move on and look at the second dramatic event, Jesus crying out. Verse 34. And at three in the afternoon, Jesus cried out in a loud voice, Eloi, Eloi, lemma sabachthani, which means, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me, as his death approaches. It's now 3 p.m. The Lord Jesus has been hanging in agony for six hours. This seems like an interminably long period of time, but this was, by the normal standards of crucifixion, a short time. It was not unusual for victims to survive for up to 48 hours before succumbing to death. Imagine that hanging from nails driven through your flesh for two whole days. Jesus at this point cries out in a loud voice, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? He's not crying out at the unbearable physical pain that he was enduring. 
He was, of course, in great physical pain, but his cry is a plea of agony that derives deep from within his soul. It's not the pain of death that troubles him, it's the pain of the separation that he experiences at this time from the Father. For all of eternity he had enjoyed the presence and companionship of the Father, but now, for the first and only time, he is suffering alone. This is because Jesus has become sin for us. He has taken our place. He acts as our substitute, bearing our sin. So he suffers here the judgment for sin that we deserve. A perfectly holy God can have no part of sin and therefore must separate himself from it. Mark records Jesus' words in Aramaic, Eloi, Matthew in Hebrew, Eli, which is correct. Which language did the Lord Jesus use? We cannot be certain, and in truth it does not really matter. But I am more inclined to think that he used Aramaic. My reasoning being that Mark is interested in capturing Jesus' cry from the heart. In times of anguish and distress, we express our feelings in the language that we are most comfortable and fluent in. In Jesus' case, this was Aramaic. Matthew, by contrast, is more concerned with emphasising Jesus' quotation of Psalm 22, verse 1. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why are you so far from helping me, and from the words of my groaning? Thankfully, because of what Christ did for us on the cross, we will never experience separation from God. There will never be a time when we suffer alone. Those whom he has chosen and elected for salvation are indwelt by the Holy Spirit. God, therefore, is always with us. But let's read on and see how those nearby interpreted and reacted to Jesus' words. Verses 35 and 36. When some of those standing near heard this, they said, Listen, he's calling Elijah. Someone ran, filled a sponge with wine vinegar, put it on a staff and offered it to Jesus to drink. Now leave him alone. Let's see if Elijah comes to take him down, he said. Those standing nearby hear, or more accurately, mishear Jesus' words. You see, in Aramaic, Eloi or Hebrew Eli sound very similar to the name Elijah, Eliah. So the people think that he's calling out to the prophet Elijah. Elijah, as I'm sure you all remember, was taken up to heaven in a whirlwind. You can read about this in 2 Kings chapter 2. He's one of only two men in scripture who went to heaven without dying. Why would someone call out for Elijah? Well, Jewish tradition said that Elijah was present at the Passover meal. There was also the belief that Elijah was a messianic type figure who would return to rescue the righteous when needed. In Malachi chapter 4 verse 5 we read the following, Behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord. So the bystanders seem to believe that Jesus is calling for Elijah to come and rescue him. As we have repeatedly seen throughout Mark's Gospel, it was not uncommon for the people to misunderstand Jesus' words. Those watching assume Jesus is in particular or acute discomfort, in particular that he is thirsty. Doctors suggest that his great thirst is one of the many indicators that he is suffering from hypervolemic shock or blood loss. This condition manifests when the human body has lost more than 20% of its blood and the kidneys stop functioning in order to preserve what body fluid is left. The patient in such a state is left with extreme thirst. Therefore the people offer him a drink to try and alleviate at least some of his anguish. Sour wine vinegar is mentioned in the Old Testament as being a refreshing drink. We also know that it was a popular beverage appreciated by the common people because it relieved thirst more effectively than water and was also less expensive. It was a mix of water and eggs with a splash of wine vinegar to keep it from spoiling. Someone, either a Roman soldier or one of the bystanders, soaks a sponge and attaching it to a staff offers it to Jesus. Then they decide to leave him alone. We don't know whether them saying, let's see if Elijah comes to take him down, is said genuinely or as a further act of mockery. In the contest, it seems most likely that they are continuing to mock him. Well, let's read on. Verse 37. With a loud cry, Jesus breathed his last. 
Mark records Jesus speaking or crying out just twice whilst he hangs upon the cross. The first is a cry of agony at being abandoned by God. The second is a cry of triumph or perhaps relief at fulfilling his divine purpose. The cry Mark is referring to here may be just a wordless guttural expression. John in his gospel records Jesus saying, It is finished. Luke quotes, Father, into my hands I commit my spirit. With this cry of whatever it was, Jesus died. Over the centuries there have been many hypotheses about the actual cause of Jesus' death. Was it a broken heart, asphyxia, circulatory failure, a rupture of the heart lining or shock due to excessive blood loss? Whatever the cause, it's clear that Jesus did not die the ordinary death of a crucified man. The two robbers who were alongside him did not die as he had. Their legs had to be broken in order to bring about their demise. For the Gospel writers, there's clearly something special about Jesus' death. He deliberately released his spirit, meaning that his death was a supernatural event. Well, let's turn now and consider the next dramatic event. It occurred in the Jewish temple. Verse 38. The curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. In order to explain the significance of this dramatic event, I need to lay out the setup of the Jewish temple. The temple consisted of a series of rooms or spaces, each more exclusive than the last. The outer space was the court of the Gentiles. This space could be accessed by all, both Jew and Gentile. From here we enter into the temple proper. This space was designated for Jews only. Gentiles were excluded. The first space one entered in the temple proper was the court of women. Again, Jews of either sex could freely access this space. From here we move into the court of the men of Israel. As its name suggests, this space was open only to Jewish men. Women were therefore excluded. From here we move into the court of the priests. This area was accessible only to the Levitical priesthood. Jewish men who were not priests were excluded. Standing at the very heart of the temple complex was the Holy of Holies. This area was divided off or separated from the rest of the temple by a thick curtain or veil. The historian Josephus records that this curtain was 80 feet high, 30 feet wide and 4 inches thick. So we are talking about a massive curtain which required 300 priests to manipulate it. The curtain separated or divided off the most sacred part of the temple. Only one man, the high priest, was permitted to enter the Holy of Holies. He was only allowed to access it on one day of the year, the Day of Atonement. It was this curtain that was torn from top to bottom when the Lord Jesus Christ died. So the key thing I want you to think about is as follows. Who had access to God in the temple system? The answer is only one very special person, and only at one very special time of the year. So what's going on? What does this torn curtain mean? Well, remember what I just told you about the dimensions of this curtain. No human being would be able to tear it in two. This, then, was a supernatural act performed by God. All the synoptic writers record this dramatic event, but none of them take the time to explain it. Fortunately for us, the writer of Hebrews tells us what it means. He explains at great length that the curtain being torn signifies the opening up of the Holy of Holies. It means that God's presence is no longer an exclusive space, limited to only a few and at only only at certain times. The curtain being torn indicates that the old way represented by the temple and the sacrificial system was now finished. Now, because of Christ's completed work, we have a new and permanent way in which to access God. All those who have put their faith in Christ have full and complete access to God. What a wonderful thing that is. But let's turn now and look at the fifth and final dramatic event. Verse 39. And when the centurion who stood there in front of Jesus saw how he died, he said, Surely this man was the Son of God. Roman crucifixion was carried out by specialist execution teams. These teams were made up of five men. 
four foot soldiers who were led by a centurion. The centurion was the man responsible for supervising the whole event. It is this man who has witnessed all that has transpired who says, Surely this man was the Son of God. Matthew adds that the centurion was influenced by a sudden earthquake, while Luke says that the centurion glorified God, saying, Certainly this was a righteous man. What was it that so impressed this hard-bitten Roman soldier, a man who had probably supervised many similar executions? Obviously he had been witness to the sudden strange darkness. Did this impress him? It's unlikely that he would have ascribed it to Jesus. Did he know about the temple curtain tearing? That seems unlikely, and again it's highly doubtful that he would have noted the symbolic significance. So it must have been something he witnessed in the Lord Jesus. Was it Jesus' unnatural self-control under excruciating pain? Did Jesus exude a sense of power, control or authority that profoundly impacted this man? Was he simply and yet profoundly touched by the power of the Holy Spirit? The Gospel writers do not tell us. What we might ask did he mean when he described Jesus as the Son of God? Scholars have long debated what he might have meant. Did he mean that Jesus is accepting his fate as a loyal servant of the deity he serves? Rather like if you visit a government building and the staff are polite and helpful, that it reflects well on the government. You might say, well, that worker is a great servant of the state. Or possibly he really does think that Jesus is the Messiah, the son of the Jewish God. In Roman culture, the emperor was considered as a son of the gods, and the centurion may be saying, Jesus is clearly by his actions demonstrating that he is the son of a god. Or perhaps as a polytheistic Roman, he believed that Jesus was the literal son of one of the many gods. But maybe, just maybe, it's something altogether different. Perhaps as he looked up at our Lord and Saviour, he truly saw Jesus for who he was. Have you ever had the experience in life when you look at something and see it in a fresh and new way? As an experiment, I recommend on an ice spring day going out and looking really closely at a flower or plant. You might even use a magnifying app on your phone to do so. You may have glanced at similar plants or flowers a thousand times before, but on this occasion, really study it closely. Open your eyes and also your mind to seeing something special. I guarantee that you'll be astounded at the intricacy and beauty of God's amazing design. So maybe this centurion looked up at Jesus and saw past the blood and the grime. He looked up and realised that he was indeed looking at the Son of God. Well, let's conclude by looking at another group who also looked upon Jesus on the cross. This is 40 to 41. Some women were watching from a distance. Among them were Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James the younger and of Joseph, and Salome. In Galilee these women had followed him and cared for his needs. Many other women who had come up with him to Jerusalem were also there. Mark tells us that Jesus did not die alone among strangers and enemies. There were a group of his female followers who watched and witnessed what occurred from a safe distance. Among this group, we are told, were Mary Magdalene. She had lo loyally followed Jesus for several years, ever since Jesus had cast seven demons from her. Also present was Mary, the mother of James and Joseph, who is also identified as the wife of Clopas. The other named woman is Salome, of whom we know nothing. Mark tells us that these women, along with an unspecified additional number who had been loyal followers in Galilee, had come along with him to Jerusalem. Mary, Jesus' mother and the disciple John had been present at the crucifixion, but they are not mentioned here. As you may remember, Jesus gave John the task of caring for his mother, so perhaps by this point John had taken her away. These verses serve as a useful reminder to us of just how radical and revolutionary Jesus was. He arrived in a culture in which women were considered inferior to men, a culture in which men ruled and women were not considered worthy of an education or a prominent role in society. But this was not Jesus' view. 
He showed his peers how he viewed women to be equal to men and worthy of honour, respect and freedom. He welcomed them as his followers, taught them and interacted with them freely. This, of course, does not mean that he made them apostles or pastors, but we should never overlook the important role that they played in his ministry. Here they demonstrate their bravery and loyalty. The disciples have fled. Jesus is surrounded by a mocking, baying mob. But standing there unmoved and undaunted are these brave and loving female followers. Next time, Lord willing, we will turn our attention to Jesus' burial. Things to think about. I have two comments to make on today's passage of scripture. Number one, a new way to God. One of the changes I noticed on my recent trip to the UK was that a new chain of gyms had opened up. Almost every town I visited had a branch of this particular gym. Its unique selling point was that once you paid a monthly membership fee, this allowed you 24 hour access seven days a week to any gym in the chain. Whenever you fancied lifting some weights or using the running machine, you could just go. It was a nice idea. But I began to wonder how many people brought memberships and then just visited occasionally, or even not at all. There's a big difference between having membership in a gym and actually using the gym. It certainly seems to be the case that many people will buy something like gym membership initially with good intentions and then end up not using it. As I discussed during the sermon, Jesus' death opened up a new way to access God. The symbolic tearing of the temple curtain brought to an end the old system, a system in which the Holy of Holies was separated from normal people. Christ's atoning sacrifice for sinners opened up a new and constant way for us to enter into the presence of our awesome holy God. Jesus' sacrifice makes it possible for us to come to God the Father whenever we desire. Our sins no longer separate us from him. Today anyone who puts their trust in Jesus Christ has constant access to God. 2 Corinthians 5.21 explains that God made him who had no sin to be sin for us, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. So how should we live in light of this new wonderful news? Obviously with great gratitude and joy. But I wonder if we sometimes think of entering into God's presence rather like gym membership. Something that's nice to know, nice to have, but not something we often use. This is a great shame, especially when we think about what buying our membership cost the Lord Jesus. So let me encourage you to make entering into God's presence a daily activity. Make it a positive habit, just like exercise. Devote time to prayer, Bible reading, meditation, or other forms of praise and worship. Let nothing distract or hold you back from entering with great joy into the presence of our awesome God. Number two, the importance of women. The role and place of women within the church is a controversial subject today. It's an issue that has led to fierce debates and occasionally churches even splitting. The issue for feminists rests in their belief that there should be no distinctions between what men and women can do. Therefore, they argue, women can be pastors or elders and have leadership roles within the church. As you are aware, I do not hold this opinion. The Bible, I believe, is quite clear that leadership roles within the church are reserved for men. But as I always say, this is not because God sees women as being inferior to men. It's simply the way God has designed the church to function. However, with all this being said... This does not mean that women do not have an important role to play. Far from it. Women are vital to the church. Women were equally vital in the life and ministry of the Lord Jesus. We see throughout the Gospels that he showed a special love and respect towards women. He didn't treat them as being weak, inferior or lesser to men in any way. He knew that they loved and were devoted to him and he in turn loved them for it. So to the men listening to these words... Let us value and appreciate the importance of women. Let us observe and be grateful for all they do in our lives and in the life of the church. And to the women listening, thank you for your often unheralded service. Thank you for all you do and know that you are important and valued both by God and by the church.
Immediately in the morning, the chief priests held a consultation with the elders and scribes and the whole council. And they bound Jesus, led him away, and delivered him to Pilate. Then Pilate asked him, Are you the king of the Jews? It is, as you say. And the chief priests accused him of many things, but he answered nothing. Do you answer nothing? See how many things they testify against you? But Jesus still answered nothing, so that Pilate marveled. Now at the feast, he was accustomed to releasing one prisoner to them, whomever they requested. And there was one named Barabbas, who was chained with his fellow rebels. They had committed murder in the rebellion. Then the multitude, crying aloud, began to ask him to do just as he had always done for them. But Pilate answered them, Do you want me to release to you the king of the Jews? For he knew that the chief priests had handed him over because of envy. But the chief priests stirred up the crowd so that he should rather release Barabbas to them. What then do you want me to do with him whom you call the king of the Jews? So they cried out again. Why? What evil has he done? But they cried out all the more. So Pilate, wanting to gratify the crowd, released Barabbas to them. And he delivered Jesus, after he had scourged him, to be crucified. Then the soldiers led him away into the hall called Praetorium, and they called together the whole garrison. And they clothed him with purple, and they twisted a crown of thorns, put it on his head, and began to salute him. Hail, King of the Jews! Hail, King of the Jews! Then they struck him on the head with a reed, and spat on him. And bowing the knee, they worshipped him. And when they had mocked him, they took the purple off him, put his own clothes on him, and led him out to crucify him. Then they compelled a certain man, Simon of Cyrene, the father of Alexander and Rufus, as he was coming out of the country and passing by, to bear his cross. And they brought him to the place Golgotha, which is translated, place of a skull. Then they gave him wine mingled with myrrh to drink, but he did not take it. And when they crucified him, they divided his garments, casting lots for them to determine what every man should take. Now it was the third hour, and they crucified him. And the inscription of his accusation was written above, The King of the Jews. With him, they also crucified two robbers, one on his right and the other on his left. So the scripture was fulfilled which says, And he was numbered with the transgressors. And those who passed by blasphemed him, wagging their heads and saying, Aha! You who destroy the temple and build it in three days, save yourself and come down from the cross. Likewise, the chief priests also, mocking among themselves with the scribes. He saved others. Himself he cannot save. Let the Christ, the King of Israel, descend now from the cross, that we may see and believe. Even those who were crucified with him reviled him. Now, when the sixth hour had come, there was darkness over the whole land until the ninth hour. And at the ninth hour, Jesus cried out with a loud voice, saying, Hello, Lama, Sephardimis, which is translated, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Some of those who stood by when they heard that said, Look, he's calling for Elisha. Then someone ran and filled a sponge full of sour wine, put it on a reed and offered it to him to drink. Let him alone. Let us see if Elijah will come to take him down. And Jesus cried out with a loud voice <laughs> and breathed his last. The 
and the veil of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. So when the centurion who stood opposite him saw that he cried out like this and breathed his last, he said, Truly this man was the son of God. <laughs> there were also women looking on from afar, among whom was Mary Magdalene, Mary, the mother of James the Less and of Joses, and Salome, who also followed him and ministered to him when he was in Galilee, and many other women who came up with him to Jerusalem. Now, when evening had come, because it was the preparation day, that is, the day before the Sabbath, Joseph of Arimathea, a prominent council member, who was himself waiting for the kingdom of God, coming and taking courage, went into Pilate and asked for the body of Jesus. Pilate marveled that he was already dead, and summoning the centurion, he asked him if he had been dead for some time. So when he found out from the centurion, he granted the body to Joseph. Then he bought fine linen, took him down, and wrapped him in the linen. And he laid him in a tomb which had been hewn out of the rock, and rolled a stone against the door of the tomb. And Mary Magdalene and Mary the mother of Joses observed where he was laid. <laughs> 